last week I introduced this based on the, on the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4. So I want to look back at that. But I want to try to let you into my world a little bit. Um, and and it's, it's, it, confession sounds a little too strong because I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. But, but one, of the, uh, one of the realities that I face at this stage in my life and teaching is uh, I am super excited about the revelation of, of the Father and His love for us and of the centrality of Jesus and of the pervasive diligence of the Holy Spirit to be in our lives. And yet, uh, I'm to the point where I'm learning stuff and as I think about talking about it, it feels like I can't do anything except complicate it because it's so simple. And I mean, I, that wasn't something I got out of Scripture. I just was feeling that. I was feeling like, wow, this is amazing. But I feel like every effort, every set of words I try to put out to you guys makes it more complicated than it feels, more complicated than it sounds. You know what I mean? And then I ran across this amazing Scripture. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians. And I mean, really ran across it. It was like, wow, <laughs> this is cool. All right, so let me, let me read this a little bit to you, and then we're going to go back and review the, the objective of, of why I'm talking to you about this heart connection thing. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to start reading, um, right in verse 1. It says, I wish, this is Paul talking, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if, it, if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit in which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Now, I'm not in the habit of suggesting that there's a lot of stuff in Scripture that's sarcastic, but that last line is. That last line is. Paul is, is reacting to accusations about his apostleship, but he's, in, 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 in Pauline way, in, in an apostle's way, uh, he's not defending himself. He's brokenhearted over the misperception that the people are having and what they're, what's at risk for them. And then I also want you to notice something else. How many of you have New American Standard? Okay, uh, for those of you that don't, the words of devotion are italicized and they do not exist in the Greek text. And so there's a variety of translations that, that make this difficult. Uh, I, this is another thing, talking about making things more complicated. I was down at Springs Rescue Mission. I was talking to one of the staff members down there about a sense I had, because they've asked me to come down there and do some teaching and uh, devotional work and stuff. And it was a sense I had of, of simplifying the issue for the guys because most of them come in there with a really distant image of God and a very, sen uh, a very strong sense of him being disapproving of them because they've screwed their lives up with addictions and things like that. But as I was explaining this thing that I feel like I'm getting from the Lord, that guy said, you know, he said, I understand what you're saying, the words and stuff, but he said, I just like it when the guys just sit down in front of a Bible, they don't get all confused about translations, and they just let the word hit them. And it's just the pure word. It's not somebody teaching all that kind of stuff. Now, I don't disagree with that. But on the other hand, uh, I left that meeting checking with myself about teaching this concept. And we got back here and had a wonderful time on the Wednesday Bible study, and Revelation was flowing, and people were getting touched. I know it, and I thought, well, no, Lord, this is what you're saying, you know. So I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that when I say this isn't in here, that that has the capacity to sow a seed of doubt into your mind. Well, should I not read the New American Standard or whatever? But here's what I want to try to encourage you. This is how I survive it. The center of the Christian faith is not the Bible. It is the Jesus that was incarnate. And the Bible 
is an inspired document. There's no question about it. And you can read pretty much whatever translation you want, and if you give your heart to it in simplicity and faith, you will learn about God. Not because of the particulars of a translation. Like, the one that always drives me nuts is when I was in Bible college, I ran across the fact that, that the, the NIV translates the word uh, noose, which is mind, heart all the time. And the, word, the Greek word for heart is cardia. And so there is a Greek word for it. Uh, now, if it says cardia, just put it heart and see what it says, you know, what, what it's mean. So when I was really young, I got kind of uh, on the wrong side of the NIV, which was difficult because I was a vineyard pastor, and it was sort of the standard fare in vineyard back in the day. So I stuck with the New American Standard. Uh, and it was primarily because of that translation there uh, where it talks about heart and mind and they just mixed them all up and they felt the liberty to do so. And I didn't think that was right. So, uh, but uh, somebody that I respect greatly, Heidi Baker, uses the NIV and she probably has more impact than anybody I know. Maybe, you know, at least as much and a lot and she loves people and it's, it's incredible. And so, uh, uh, I weaned away from the King James a long time ago. I know Nancy carries a King James everywhere she goes around the world, and God uses it and her to change lives. Uh, so I, I don't know that it makes that big a difference what the translation is, but what I'm trying to do when I say something like this is I'm trying to say, look, we're all just people, including the guys at the Lachman Foundation that translated the New American Standard. And they concentrated a lot on getting the tenses right, but when they translate a verse like this, they felt compelled to add your devotion so that this thing made sense. But it doesn't need that. As a matter of fact, it's somewhat of a, of a stumbling block, I think, because it makes this passage about you. And it isn't really about you, it's about Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Let me read it again. For I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Of course that's about us. This is what Paul's talking about. He's talking about our standing, our, who we are and everything, right? This is verse 2. For I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Virgin, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind will be led astray from the simplicity and purity that is Christ. That is literally what the Greek says. The simplicity and purity that is Christ. Okay? It doesn't say anything about our devotion to Christ. The simplicity and purity does not supply, does, does not modify or describe Jason's devotional life. It describes Jesus, which is the root and foundation of Jason's devotional life. And also of Jason's work life, secular life, love life, friendship life, thought life. You know what I'm saying? And we lose, we lose that if we're not careful. And it seems to me that the world is full of distractions. The world of living, the world of life, the world of work, the world of church is a religious type of church situations. And I'm not even saying religion is always a bad thing. But it's full of distractions, and the only thing it really tries to distract you from is Jesus himself. It turns him into something else. Now, look at what Paul says. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind will be led astray from the simplicity and purity that is Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, you bear this beautifully. And that's where I think the sarcasm was. He's saying, look, if somebody comes in here and for whatever motive or reason, preaches another Jesus. Now, what is another Jesus? Well, by definition, another Jesus is not the one that Paul was confronted with on the road to Damascus. It's a different Jesus. It's a Jesus that has somehow been modified or concocted by somebody, or whatever the case is. And, you know, we've all, most everybody in this, this here has been in church long enough to understand that we have the ability to conjure all variety of Jesuses up in our head. All right? I know that sounds freaky, but all right, let me... You look like it sounds freaky. Okay. 
Uh, we can think that Jesus is not for us. We can think that Jesus is, that we're not valuable enough to capture his attention because he's busy with big things. We can think that Jesus just was concerned about dying for our sins and isn't concerned about walking with us in the mundane things of life. We had a testimony two weeks ago at the Monday Bible study that was so super beautiful. Uh, Tommy Wanamaker and her husband Tom have been working on getting their rental house or sold and it's been a big thing. And, and there they are the ones doing the uh, repair work. And so Tommy's doing things like caulking and painting and stuff like that. And she was beginning to feel overwhelmed by all the choices and all this kind of stuff. And uh, during her time with the Lord, she felt like the Lord said, well, why don't you let me do it with you? Well, that never really occurred to her. Then she, has a, she says she has a vision. And the vision is of Jesus in painting clothes. And she goes, you're kidding. You'd be willing to caulk with me? And he caulked with me, and he <laughs> caulked with me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so this was Tommy's vision. This was Jesus telling her something very profound. And the profound part about it is that he cares about our lives. He cares about us because our lives are about and a part of us. And so uh, I, I just thought that was wonderful. And that's, that's kind of what is going on here. So if you think that, now, there are a whole bunch of people, I guarantee you, there are a whole bunch of people that we could identify and go and tell that story to, and they would, their reaction would range from mocking, like, well, God doesn't do that, to actually trying to re-instruct us in the nature and the holiness of God. Because that level of familiarity, they feel like, would be... Um, Maybe not blasphemy, but well, what's the word? Disrespectful. And I, okay, so that's why I, I'm, I'm sensitive to these things that rob the intimacy that Jesus is extending from us. And, and I want us to, to do that. Okay, so back to my thing where I feel like, wow. Uh, uh, I don't see how I can talk about this with making it more complicated than it is. Then I ran across the scripture and I go, wow, I understand now why. Because why? Because our faith is the purity and the simplicity that is Jesus. Your Savior is not a distant Savior. He's not a religious Savior. He is, in fact, the King of the universe. And He is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And He is the High Priest of your salvation. And he is the son of the living God. And he is the incarnate son of the Father. And all of these are extremely extraordinary bits of his identity. And they are all very real. And they are all very important. But fundamentally, he is the son of his Father sharing that sonship with us. And he says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Because, and he explained why. Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. And I have disclosed all things to you. This is very important. It's very important. And so, but it's very important, and it's only able to be gotten a hold of, I'm really understanding this, in this one way. You have to surrender to the simplicity and the purity that is Jesus. And that's what we're about. That's what God is trying to give us an opportunity at Joyland to do is to swipe away the distractions and, and, and all of this. And, and I'm not saying that there isn't going to be a time in your life or in your ministry or in your family that you're not going to relate to Jesus as the king or as the lamb slain. But what I'm saying is that if there's anything temporary about him, it's, it, and that's not really the right way to say it, if there's anything that is like uniquely uh, focused, it's those things. The thing, the person, the reality of who Jesus is, is this purity and simplicity of being the Father's Son and having an open arm to share His life with you and I. Or more specifically, to pull us into His life. And so this is a simple thing. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 4 because it begins to help 
I think, at least it helps me understand what the heck I'm, you know, feeling and going on. So here we are in Ephesians 4, starting in, in uh, verse 11, or starting in verse 10, it says, <clears throat> verse 10 here. Um, now he who descended is himself he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors, and some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And I might have made this point last week, but I want to make it here. Paul is distinguishing among these gifts, like apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, and they're real gifts. They're, they're graces that God gives through people uh, that are little bits of Jesus. And if you trick them all out, he's all of these things. He's the apostle and high priest of our faith, uh, he is the good teacher. Uh, you know, he's, he's all of these things, okay? But Paul, being one of these things, reaches to his bigger destiny than being an apostle. And he says, uh, so he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we, Paul included himself in the saints, until we. And he would include Peter, John, James, and Philip the Evangelist, and all these other people in the same way. Before and after we are apostles or prophets or ministers of any type, we are sons and saints. And, and Paul recognizes that. So he goes on and says, this is this great purpose uh, for the equipping of the saints to the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, as a result, we are no longer to be children. And I told you last week, that's nepios, that's the non-speaking infant. So we're not to be silent. We're not to be speechless. We're not to be... Uh, unable to, 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 to speak and all of that, and then tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ. Now let me back up to this. So the thing that we're, the thing that, that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are supposed to do is we're supposed to train people up so that they're not vulnerable to these things. Now, what are these things? As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Now, this requires interpretation. And so, don't let anybody fool you into saying, I don't interpret the Bible, I just take it literally. Well, does that mean this only applies to people who live on islands? No, of course not. It's the, it's, it's, the, it's the tidal effect that goes on in life. It's the things that sweep by us and seek to want to wash us away and carry us away. And then it goes on and it talks about winds of doctrine. Winds of doctrine, winds of teaching, winds of instruction is actually what the word is. And, and, uh, and so what we're designed to be is we're designed to be built up and edified as saints and later we see connected to one another so that when one teaching comes flowing through, it's not the big thing. Now, our church in, in our culture is characterized with people who want to go after the I'm Apollos, I'm Paul, all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying, let's, let's not do that, but I'm not saying let's not listen to the teaching. I'm saying let's keep our ear to the ground for what the Father's saying through people. But being a, a disciple of somebody is not the goal. It is being a disciple of Jesus. It is being a person who is secure and comfortable embracing the purity and the simplicity that is Christ. And the honest truth is, I don't have the right to tell you what that looks like in your life. I don't. You, you have that relationship. For Tommy, in this season of her life, she's relating to Jesus who's wearing white pants with paint on him. And I'm not, I, I, I have no issue with that and no reason. Now, is it possible that somebody could have an idea that's like so weird that, that I need to step in as a pastor perhaps or something? I guess so. 
But what makes it so weird? And I would suggest that I need to get better at recognizing when somebody has cast aside or been driven from the purity and the simplicity that is Christ. And they've got some complicated works-oriented formula or some complicated guilt-driven relationship going on. And, 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 and then maybe, maybe I need to wrap my arms around them and go, whoa, take a breath. Let's talk about Jesus a little bit. Who is He? What did He do? Why did He do it? And then we get back to the simplicity. And so now I'm starting... I mean, even as I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm starting to have a little more encouragement that, uh, yes, it almost seems like I always am going to complicate it more than it really is, but maybe that's just a byproduct of words. But if I can convey to you and you can convey to me and we can hold one another in a way accountable, and that's a difficult word because it's been misused terribly, uh, but if we can hold one another accountable to stay focused on the purity and simplicity of Jesus in our lives a and in the willingness of that pure and simple Savior that we have, our brother, our friend, to be with us in our life, in our jobs, and in our families, and in our questions, then we can serve an enormous uh, purpose for one another. An enormous supportive purpose. So it doesn't then surprise me as we get on further here that Paul says that the body then is able to build itself up in love by what every joint supplies. So the, the initial conversation between you and Meg created something between you that has the power to birth assurance, security, the sorts of things that Jesus wants to give. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Um, we, we experienced that, and we were talking about stuff. And I will really encourage you to stay with it and get that third person because there's some dynamic here, and I don't even know yet. I'm, I'm like speaking just... Uh, I know it's true. I don't know why it's true. I think I know why. I think it's because there is a triune DNA running through all of life and creation. And when things happen in that triune framework, and that's what a three-way call is, is it's you and you and you being one in purpose, but still remaining yourself unique. And so that is such an image of the reality of the triune nature of God. And then it's that relationship that now exists in, in and if you think about it, if you have, if you have uh, I was talking to Janet about this, if you have two people, there's only one space in between. And you can, this can be perverted pretty easily. Okay, and what, what I mean by that is you have this opinion, this view of it, and this view of it, and this thing very often that is shared between somebody becomes either an issue or an aspect of control. In other words, all of the, the ridiculous teachings about covering that we've endured in the church are based on this. This person is over this person, so I'm covering you. And it's wrong, you know? And I know the intent is good, but the only place in the Bible I think you can find it is where Ruth laid at the feet of Boaz, and so if that's what they're asking for, sorry, that isn't what applies here. <laughs> now, you think about it. I don't believe there's... there's what there is, though, is there's, there's relationship. Covering suggests this, too. It suggests that the person that is providing the covering is on top, right? Because you don't ever cover anything from underneath except a gymnast or a trapeze artist. I'm covering you, <laughs> but that's a better picture. But anyway, let's toss the whole thing out. And then how many times is, does, does this seem like it's such a wonderfully intimate thing and the minute something goes wrong, it becomes a horrible thing between two people? You know, this kind of... All right, so all I'm saying is, this isn't how the universe is built. This is how the universe is built. And I was saying earlier that that creates three spaces, but that's not really true. It creates one here, one here, one here, one 
And then it creates the ones in between, across, or whatever the case is. It's weird. There's just more dimensions. You know, we live in a three-dimensional physical world. There's just a lot of this stuff that seems to be a byproduct in creation and in the breathing of life into us that is from a triune God, a Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so if we put ourselves in that position, I really, really believe in very practical and real ways you're going to experience a dynamic that doesn't exist with just two. Uh, and I, I mean, I enjoyed that with you and Sonny in our call this week because it went unexpected places and it went familiar places. And it didn't get stuck in the familiar places and nobody was hum-hawing around about trying to figure out a, a good place to go. It was just, you know, Sonny had his perspective and Dennis had his perspective and I had mine. And then when it was time for prayer, the prayers were unique and nobody walked away carrying one inordinate burden. I don't feel like, I felt like it was just really good, you know? So I think there's something to it. And, and I also think that uh, simple stuff, like when we were a little kid, we had three-legged stools in our house. Uh, do you guys ever have those little wooden stools that, yeah, with three legs. And I know they're not, they're not totally stable. Yeah, we got, no, well, those are four-legged. I only made threes. They're not totally stable, but you know what? They will sit on any surface. A four-legged stool won't. If you've got an under, you know, <clears throat> a three-legged stool will absolutely just go womp and sit there which is why they, I think, use three-legged stools outside in milking things and stuff like that. So there's just something, because each of those legs can provide its own unique support, even if they have to reach into an unstable surface. And I, I mean, I could get weird about this, I guess, but I think it comes from the DNA that spoke the world in, into creation, in time into creation. I think so. And so by the simple act of acknowledging that sort of as an act of worship, you know, Father, there's something, uh, there's something about this. This isn't just me and one other person. There's three of us here. And we're going to start sharing. And, and you say, and he does say where two are. So I'm not discounting that. But where two or three are together, they'll be in their midst. So that's why I'm excited about giving that shot. And I think that it'll create stability. I think it'll create that dynamic of exchange. I think it will allow us. And here's one of the things that keeps people from connecting on a heart-to-heart -heart level. is because we all are broken one way or another, throughout life. Things happen and stuff. And it is really uh, somewhat intimidating to open your heart up like that um, and, 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 and run the risk of and maybe feel like I'm taking advantage of this person or they're taking advantage of me or something like that. I think that is minimized when we have this three thing going. Because you can go... Uh, well, how are things going? Oh, they're going pretty good. I, where's Greg? I lost my job. Well, you know, unless it's a really unusual circumstances, he's one person out of three that are facing that. Another person has another issue. Another person has another issue. And all of a sudden, the, the invitation, the temptation, not invitation, the temptation to get sucked into your thing is divided in half by the other two people. I just think it's a wonderful thing. So that's why I'm going to stick with it, encourage it. And, and then I, I do want to share with you guys that the Lord, the thing the Lord said to me is, is that what these threes will do as we connect with one another is they will connect with each other and they'll create a foundation, but it won't be like a concrete foundation. Because a concrete foundation, you know what I'm talking about with cement and steel and stuff, which is what we're all used to in building our house. A concrete foundation is very unyielding. This is like a weave of a fabric. And I, I think we're going to see the benefit where it can take a hit and not break. Or, more importantly, somebody can fall into one of our little foundations and not get bruised. Because they're not falling on a stone or an inflexible thing. They're falling on a woven fabric that has the capacity to absorb their hurt and their obnoxiousness and their confusion and not be torn apart. So this is really kind of a big deal to me. Uh, but I think it all goes back to this idea of simplicity. Yes, Janet? Is that two yeah, it's not easily broken. Yeah. See, and, and, and here's the deal. I, I, I'm, I'm so thankful that the Lord's changing my thinking and I, I'm thankful he's changing yours. I used to think about that as just like a, a, a triune metaphor, you know, 
In other words, yeah, that's true. You had that there, you know. And it, it was like a, a little thing that was designed to get me to think about God. Now I realize that it's an illustration of what strength is like <laughs> because it comes from God. And I, I just, I, I really believe this is, a, I believe we're on a wonderful path. Let me keep going a little bit here in Ephesians 4, get down to the end of it. So as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Okay, here's another word picture application. Uh, have you ever put a, a big tall antenna up on your roof or on your house? How many guy wires did you use minimum? You had to use three because you can't hold it up with two. You can crank that baby down as tight as you want and it'll go <laughs> or it'll pull back into him. But three gives you those three reference points, those three anchor points. And then that thing won't move. It will not move. Uh, the same thing goes on, on when, you, when you cross a barn, the re, or like a barn door or a gate door. The reason you put one of those triangles across it is because it establishes three points of strength and it won't flex. If you build a square, make a gate, it'll sag quick. There's something to it. It's in there. You know, it's in there. It's in there. And, uh, and we're, we're, and this is the beauty. We are being invited in. That's what inclusion means. You know, there's a big old uh, fight over the doctrine of inclusion because people think you're talking about universalism or whatever the case. All inclusion means is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had the capacity to open up their circle, their family, and include you and I in it. That's all it means. That that's the, the, the thought behind creation. That's the thought behind Jesus' incarnation. That's the thought behind the resurrection. That's the thought behind him leading captivity captives. Is there's this, this space that we are invited into. And you, you can't do that with one. And it's, it's uh, more, way less stable with two. All right. By every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Um, there's, there's stuff in these words that's really interesting. Uh, the, the idea of the trickery of men, and then over where Paul talks about uh, corruptibility, it literally means to rot or to spoil, to go bad like a piece of fruit or a piece of meat. And, and the danger that Paul is saying that when we join together and when we relate to one another, we avoid is that thing sitting on the counter spoiling. Because there is a dynamic between those three. And I don't know all that it means, but literally that's what the word means. It, it, the, the idea of uh, it means to, 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 to rot. And then the trickery part, that's the craftiness part and the corruption part. The trickery part is literally, I used to think, well, that must mean that he's talking just about those evil false teachers. <laughs> Not necessarily. He's talking about people who are trying to figure this thing out as if it were a single line. Like one of the beauties about, uh, one of the beauties about being included in the Trinity, and, and I really owe this to Baxter Kruger for the teaching about it, but he says this, he says that if you assume that there is separation instead of union, then the most important thing you can ever think about is how to bridge the gap of that separation. And if you're not sure how to do it, then you're going to be very vulnerable to the most charismatic person that says they know how. And that's what I think is here. I don't even think this necessarily imputes bad motives to people. I think people go, well, I know how this goes. And so you should follow me and take me. And one thing I'm learning here is I'm not adverse to anybody following me or paying attention to what I say when I teach. But the, if you do, and if I teach properly with what I understand now, you will be a free person, not a follower of me. You won't have to because the life that I'm trying to get you to understand is built within that triune structure of God. It's his invitation, not mine, not Joyland's, not our denomination, not whatever version of charismatic uh, third wave thing we are. And the same thing goes in here. This is why 
I'm less concerned with how you interpret a given passage of Scripture as what that interpretation says to you in your heart about the, the love and the invitation and the openness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for you. And if you have to work, if this thing leads to a sense of work where you've got to strive to try to please God and do the right thing and find your narrow path through that thing, and I know there's scriptures that, that uh, speak of all those things, but I'm telling you, we're corrupted in our ability to read those scriptures and understand them. It's not that there's anything wrong with scripture. It's that we've been sold a bill of goods that this is about performance and jumping a gap and then I'm completely alone in this and I've got to answer to a single monitor, uh, uh, monadic God and all this kind of stuff. And it's just not true. We got the team going for us. <laughs> the team, the loving family of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have us included in that. The body of Christ. And we have the ability to find our value by linking up with others and creating a joint from which the power of each of us rightly fit together is released. And here's the other beautiful thing. It says the, the, the goal of this, the, but speaking the truth in love, okay, how many times have you in the course of your life in church either had this, the truth spoken to you or spoke the truth, but it didn't feel very much in love. I have. I've done both. I've experienced it and I've done it. So that's the kind of thing that a straight line, mono we mono, creates. That's the kind of thing covering creates. Oh, I gotta speak the truth to you in love. You know? But it's not the kind of thing that you gather around. Like that's one of the reasons I wanted the kids to pray for you. Because I want them to know they have a part in what's coming from God to you. Because they don't even know God's real yet. Most of them. Some of them do. But some of them don't. I mean, seriously, some of the little kids that Laurel's attracted from town here, they're still making a decision whether Jesus is real or not. And I, there was a time in, in my life where, because they had not yet made that decision, I would have hesitated to have them come up and pray for you. How stupid is that? That's what the, that other view of God, where it's distance and we've got to get the combination right before we can jump the the bridge, you know, or something. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they are in. So anyway, okay, let me go on down and we'll finish this up. Um, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper work of each individual part. All right, so let me uh, reinforce that this is also, this is also, um, if we understand this properly, we will have a wide open runway to understand our own value and to esteem it properly. Whereas if we're back in this linear journey with just one and one, we've got the person over you and we've got you, it's very difficult to find your value. And usually what this produces is that you start sucking up to this person in hopes of them giving you some approval so you feel okay. And that is, I don't know whether that's more dangerous for you or for them. Because then all of a sudden the person that takes this responsibility starts walking around under the burden, whether they like it or not, of making you better. That's not my job. It's nobody's job except Jesus. Sonny said something beautiful. Um, we were talking a couple weeks ago, I think it was a Monday night or something. But he says, you know, one of the biggest changes in my life, I wish he was here, I'd let him tell it. One of the biggest changes in my life was when I realized that the primary relationship between God and me is not to fix me. <laughs> and the primary way, it, it, it opened the door so that the primary way I thought about myself was not somebody who needed to be fixed. Have any of you ever been in a season in your life in church where everything that was said and everything that was done and all the opportunities and all the responsibilities that were offered to you seem to be designed to fix you. And without trying, they ended up saying, well, you're a mess. Well, maybe I am a mess, but that's not my identity. And maybe there are things that need to be fixed in me, but that's not why God's with me. I'm not one of his projects. I'm one of his sons. 
Now, I could give my father some grief like the prodigal son did, but he never became a project. He always stayed his son, and the evidence of that is how he was received when he came back. You and I are not projects. We are in relationship to this family. And, and each of the magnificent persons in the oneness of the Trinity. And, and one, is, one is really big. Uh, okay, the other thing that, that happens out of this, uh, and I don't have time to get into the Greek tonight, but the word that Paul uses twice in, in Ephesians 4 for the word unity really is a much simpler word. It literally means the number one. It just means one. It means one. And then I was reading in the Strong's Concordance, and this is another one of those things that feels like I'm trying to undermine authorities in our lives or whatever. I was reading in the, Strong, the Strong's Concordance, and it, it accurately pointed that out. And then it said, by implication, unanimity. What? No. It, being one does not imply all of us being the same. It means we're one already. That's why Paul says, preserve the, the, the oneness in the spirit and the bond of peace. And if he gives us instruction to preserve it in peace, that means that hostility and separation and division and judgment destroys that, or at least blocks us from seeing it. It doesn't destroy it because it wasn't made by us, but it blocks us from seeing it, and it makes us live as if we're separated. So anyway, I think this is a wonderful chapter. Um, We'll get right down to the last part of the verse here. For whom the whole body, uh, being fitted together and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And here's the last thing that I want to say about this chapter, and then I think I have one closing scripture to look at. One of the great tragedies in church life, and one of the great tragedies in our culture in church, is when a body can build itself up in something other than love. Because it looks good on the outside and it is corrupt on the inside. And people go there and they are persuaded that going there is the right thing to do. And, 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 and it's nobody's individual fault. It's not just the fault of the leaders. It's that we buy into the wrong system. We devalue, we overvalue leaders, and we make the path linear. And the, so somebody then that's, that's got a vision for it steps in and says, this is the way, walk ye in it. But it's not the Holy Spirit, it's not God. It's one of us. And Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. So I don't care how clear the path I see looks, I'm not seeing everything. And I recognize that. But sometimes I can't do anything about it because I'm the only guy with the, the vision and the voice, and so we'll just have to step in and see. And, and then that's the kind of thinking that takes value away from this indestructible base of people joining together and put us on the shoulders of somebody who's willing to carry that load Wrongly, wrongly. Um, and so what this is saying is the opposite of that. It says if you'll let yourself be fit together and then you'll begin to explore and experience the power that is released by that joint, we will see the body build itself up in love, which is the only way it's supposed to be and it's the only way to last. And the reason it's the only way to last is because eventually nothing else is going to exist but love. <laughs> because that's who God is. All of the other supporting staff for love, it will no longer be needed. This is not just me saying this. Paul says that prophecy will pass away. Even knowledge will pass away. What? Why will knowledge pass away? Because knowledge is the accumulation of the experiences you have, and it's the categorizing of them so that you can kind of figure out and find your way through them. Once you're fully immersed in the experience, you don't need knowledge of it. You're living it. Once you're fully immersed in Christ, in the Father, in the Spirit, 
You don't have any reason to ponder the particulars. You're just there. You just know it. You know it because you're in him and he's the way. Right. You don't have to search out the truth. He's the truth. You don't have to ask, what's the meaning of life? Because you're in it. And, and, and that, I know I'm, I'm talking way over my pay grade right now, but, but this is the truth. This is the truth. And, and so all of the categorizing and the lining up and the shuffling that we do and the seeking and searching and all that kind of stuff, all of that is a sign that we're not in, in, in that relationship fully yet, in our own heads and hearts. But the relationship's there. And so that's what I think goes on here. So however beautiful this was that you guys talked, and there's, there's you know, like I say, Jesus promised to be in the midst of two too, so I'm not harping on the two, three thing. I just think three's the way to go. But those questions you said were exchanged, those are a part of the ligaments, that's what that joint word means, that literally bind people together and create the relationship that we all hunger for. And it creates the family that we all want church to be like. And everybody wants it to be like that. And some people will find it in a small group or something like that uh, it, because God's constantly working to try to make that real in our lives. But what I'm saying is that I think the Lord's given us a beautiful, beautiful little window of time and resource to put our trust in Him. And, and the way you put your trust in Him is you connect with and put your trust in some other people. And you find that, and you, you overcome the, the, uh, the difficulty in doing that. You overcome the temptation to think that it's going to cost you too much. Uh, you just let your heart connect. And then it's a beautiful thing because it begins to manifest the reality that you're in a family and you're never alone. Okay? So, the, what was the one I was going to close with? Let's see here. Oh, it was the uh, Matthew one. Yeah, just about where Jesus made that promise. There's a lot going on here, but, um, you know, as a, as a charismatic Pentecostal guy, there's a lot of desire for me to see more healing, more answer to prayer, more power. Look at what it says here. In, uh, this is in Matthew chapter 18. Um, Jesus is doing a bunch of teaching, but in verse 19, and, and verse 18 talks about the power that has been handed to us, uh, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's a cooperative thing. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of debates about this. This is just a free one. I heard a lot of debates about this all through Bible school and up through my ranks as a pastor. Does it really mean that what you bind on earth will already have been bound in heaven or that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven? There's a lot of debate about it. I like the way it says it here because I really would prefer to know that there is a, 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 a cooperation that precedes my actions down here in heaven. But the point is, is that we're linked. We're one, we're with one another. We live our lives, whether it's binding or loosing, whether it's blessing, uh, praying, teaching, loving, serving, we do it with Jesus. And we are in him fully and fully in him in the presence of the Father, fully in him, uh, enveloped by, immersed in, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and it's, it, we don't recognize that nearly enough. But then the, the verse that is re relevant to what I'm saying here is, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. And so one of the things that I encourage you to expect and begin to learn to recognize, if you do uh, engage in these three-way call things, is that this dynamic, first of all, is a promise made by Jesus. It's as significant as any promise. When he said, Lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age, that is no bigger a promise than when two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there in their midst. And if two of you agree is touching anything, touching anything, what does that mean? In our application, it means that person A has a need. Person B and person C agree is touching person A's need. And the promise is, my Father will do this for you. That's big. That's big. Now, I loved what we did for Greg. And I appreciate you guys for praying. 
But don't you really think that prayer and the answer to prayer is supposed to be more a part of the ebb and flow of our everyday life than a particular event around an issue like that? Aren't we supposed to just be able to go, really? That's what you're facing right now? And the other person just goes, well, we're going to pray about that right now. And you touch. And you agree. And then all of a sudden, however prayer gets answered, Jesus says, it'll be done for you. So, I don't think this is just a thing. And I don't think it's a... I, I, I promise you I didn't get it out of a church stability book or <laughs> a growth book or anything. I think God is giving us an opportunity to discover in ourselves the individual destiny and power and beauty that he has invested in us by connecting with some other people and seeing life and everything there is in us come out through that. So I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, Amen. So if you don't have one or if you want to be a third to somebody, just, just talk around. But like I say, I don't think God's picky about who we do it with. So if you've got a friend, what, this is actually the technique I'd like to see us get good at. Pick somebody that you already know and love and trust. And then the two of you pick somebody else. And they don't have to be as familiar. And just just see what the dynamic would be like. And then one of the first things you'll notice is what you said, Jody. Wow, it was really nice having somebody call and care about me. <laughs> Ask some questions, do some things. And uh, who doesn't like that? Unless a person is really deeply broken. And they would love it. They just don't know how to say yes. So let's pray. Father, I am thrilled that you have entrusted us such a divine secret. And I'm saying that a little bit tongue-in-cheek because it's so obvious in Scripture, and it's even obvious in life. But God, we have been blown around by the waves and the winds of doctrine. And again, I don't necessarily ascribe negative motives to these crafty schemers because I've been a crafty schemer. I've tried to come up with something clever that would help somebody or a bunch of somebodies. And all the while, sitting right in front of my face was an invitation into relationship and to imitate that relationship in God. When I taught earlier um, this year and last year on the covenant passages in Hebrews, it gets to the point where it says, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to good deeds. And then it immediately says, and let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some is. But draw near, draw together as time goes on and as, this, as things come the way they do. So Lord, that's what we're trying to do. And I apologize and repent, Lord, for making it so complicated where it was all built around everybody gathering at one time or one place or this meeting or that meeting. Uh, and I thank you for opening my heart and eyes and our heart and eyes up to the simplicity of just connecting on a heart-to-heart -heart level with two other people. And then engaging that amazing promise that you, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, will be in our midst. And I believe it, Lord, with all my heart. And so I welcome you into every one of these little groups of three and the calls. Show yourself to be the lover of our souls and to be engaged in our lives and help us come to know you and one another and ourselves better. Because of such as these is the kingdom. So Father, bless everybody in their efforts. I know it's not easy to get schedules together and stuff, but uh, we release ourselves to you for this purpose. In the name of Jesus.